we have a man here this morning that all of us know in Cleon Skousen, who for years has been in the front of what I perceive to be a very important issue uh, of the Constitution of the United States. I perceive that the country is moving to the right or returning to constitutional principles in many areas. And I think it's fellows like him and others of like mind who are helping bring that about. It's our pleasure to hear from him this morning. He is president and founder of the National Center for Constitutional Studies. Uh, he has spent time this week in the National Bicentennial Commission in Philadelphia as part of that committee. And he has been a special advisor to many people in government and Congress. Without further introduction, we'll hear now from Cleon Skousen. Thank you very much, David. Brothers and sisters, I'm very grateful to you for taking a precious Saturday morning to share this breakfast and these few minutes with us. Uh, something very exciting has happened on the horizon that involves all of us whether we know about it or not and we might just well know about it because that's the fun of it. The 88th section of the Doctrine and Covenant says we're supposed to be studying history and prophecy and putting the two things together and realize what's happening. The Savior said that during our time I would be as it was in the days of Noah they would be marrying and giving in marriage and they just wouldn't really know that they had just suddenly come to the end of the world for that uh, thousand year period and uh, the whole human race would be wiped out. He said, we'll catch them completely unawares. They won't even know what's going on. And, uh, and the Lord said that that would be something like what would happen this time, that people would miss the great transitions that would be occurring and the great things that the prophets have been talking about for nearly 6,000 years. When I was born uh, in the church, there were 431,000 members worldwide. 431,000 members. I'm glad that I was born in the horse and buggy days. And uh, now, I, I, sitting on a jet, uh, going halfway around the world just recently, I thought, this is, this is fantastic what's happened in one generation of human experience. Well, our Heavenly Father said it was going to happen. It, it sort of comes in on us naturally. And so uh, I suppose um, that's the way prophecy is too. It's swirling around our feet now. Prophecy is being fulfilled in dimensions that are just absolutely astonishing and amazing. And if you would talk to Nephi and, and uh, Lehi, who also the, saw the same vision, so did Jacob. Isaiah saw it. And they would have said, all right, now you're moving into that part that I was talking about in chapter so-and-so. Uh, can you see it coming? Now, if you, if you put some more in the computer, you can head it off. Otherwise, it's going to be just as bad as I said it was, because I saw what would happen if you didn't get it in the computer. <coughs> anyway, that's what prophecy is for. It's to arouse us sufficiently so we do what is necessary, and the Lord's given us some marvelous promises. 21st chapter of 3rd Nephi, what we can do if we do our part in time, otherwise it'll sneak up on us and we'll be marrying and giving in marriage and have no idea that a tremendous thing has just occurred. A number of years ago, uh, the brethren, uh, the Melchizedek Priesthood Committee asked me to write an outline for a course, priesthood course, called God's Perfect Law of Liberty. And... Uh, I meditated on it for a long time before I even wrote word one. And finally, it, it started coming and it just unfolded, it just unrolled. And I had just finished uh, doing the 3,000 years at that time. And a lot of the perfect law of liberty uh, was given to Moses and belonged to that period. So I was kind of full of it. I was imbued with it. came out pretty fast. I turned it into the committee after several months working on it. and. Uh, then it was turned over to Brother Mark E. Peterson for final revision and filling out, fleshing it out, and so forth. And he was working on that at the time he passed away. So we haven't seen it yet, but it's coming. One of these days, we're going to be sitting in church and studying the perfect God's perfect law of liberty. And it's going to be exciting when we do. Now this brings me to a little story, a little background, and uh, 
I'll just share this with you. It's kind of a personal experience, but um, it demonstrates some of the lessons of life that, that I have learned. <clears throat> I knew that someday I was going to have to address Isaiah. I had done this, uh, some specialized writing and doing some books on the Book of Mormon, etc., on some of the chapters, 53, 29, 45, 54, some of the more important ones. Someday I knew I was going to have to do a verse-by-verse -verse commentary on Isaiah so I would understand it. I just knew that I never would get a grip on Isaiah if I didn't do it verse-by-verse. -verse. So I started in right at the beginning, about 14 years ago. And um, I started, uh, I said to myself, if I come to a problem passage, I'm not going to go another step till I've crossed that hurdle. And sometimes I'd spend three and four weeks just on one verse, looking it all up, seeing what the brethren said about, finally get the breakthrough, and be able to go on. And it was just this past year that we finished our verse-by-verse -verse, uh, book on Isaiah. And at the same time, I was doing another book that Isaiah was talking about. They just kind of parallel, and they both have come out here together, and both took about 14 years to complete kind of the story of two books really but um, much of it grew out of that assignment to do a, um, a priesthood outline on God's perfect law of liberty and I saw that uh, what was happening according to Isaiah and Nephi is that the Lord would do just what he said in the 21st chapter of 3rd Nephi he would uh, have this land discovered <coughs> have the Gentiles come over here cleanse it somewhat of the native population that was, uh, they'd gone cannibals and degenerate human sacrifices. They'd gone just about as low as human beings could go. And yet in their veins ran three royal lines of Ephraim and Manasseh and Judah. And they had a great future. But first of all, the land had to be cleansed of the debris and, and the garbage that had collected during years of apostasy. And then the Lord said it would be I'll have a, a land of liberty set up and I'll restore the gospel. And then you could just see it rolling along. Isaiah talks about it. Nephi talks about it. And uh, we would reach a point of, of about, <clears throat> you can't tell whether it's 1994, 95, someplace right in there. Anyway, Nephi is suddenly shut off. The Lord said, I'm not going to have you write anymore. I'm going to show it to you, but don't you write it. I want the people of that day not to know the outcome. I want them to know the options. And I just want you to warn them that this is what will happen unless they are sufficiently um, valiant and vigorous and filled with integrity to save liberty because otherwise uh, there is no opportunity for the gospel to go forward. Um, so, so Nephi saw it. And an interesting thing happened to him. Uh, he can't he can't record it, but he finds Isaiah recorded it. Only he recorded it so obscurely nobody knows what he said. <laughs> and so oh, that's, that was so thrilling to me because I began to see Nephi was right. It is in Isaiah. And so what he did was to give us the 48th and 49th chapter of Isaiah in the first book of Nephi. And uh, then he said, thought he'd explain it. And he gets going along pretty good for two or three chapters, and then he suddenly stops and says, that's as much as I durst say at this time. He's a little nervous. He's kind of on thin ice, because he's getting over there where he is recording. He's commenting on Isaiah, but he's actually recording what he saw. And so he said, this is as much as I durst say at this time. Now when he gets to be an old man, he, he uh, does second Nephi. And... Um, tells about the death of his father and some great <coughs> sermons that he had his brother Jacob give. Then right out of a clear blue sky, he gives us um, about 13 chapters out of Isaiah. And if you take the average family book of Mormon and let it fall open, it'll fall open to about 2 Nephi chapter 8 or 9, and the guilt pages haven't even been separated for the rest of the book. But the first of every January, there was a resolve to read the Book of Mormon. And that's all thumbed and it's got breakfast food on it and everything else. But after Second Nephi chapter 8, 9, or 10, that, and nobody can endure it because it just is insufferable reading. But in any event, we went through it verse by verse. And I want to tell you, it's exciting reading if you know what it's saying. Uh, but it takes some historical backgrounds, like Nephi said, uh, 
The Jews knew what he was saying. I knew what he was saying. Interestingly enough, after he's quoted 13 chapters, he doesn't comment on them at all. Instead, he jumps to, ch to chapter 29 of Isaiah and gives you a verse-by-verse -verse commentary without even telling you which part of Isaiah he's talking about. It's a verse-by-verse -verse commentary by Isaiah. Uh, woe unto Ariel, Ariel, woe unto Ariel. That's the way the 29th chapter begins. What's that talking about? Nephi says, that's us. That's us. Out of Jerusalem it came. That's what Ariel means. Ariel means Jerusalem. Out of Jerusalem it came. And Isaiah saw our day and our time. And I'll tell you what, I've seen it, and I'll tell you how terrible it is. So he goes on and tells us all about that. He tells us about the founding of America. He tells about Columbus coming over and all that sort of thing that he, he knew about. He'd seen it. And uh, then he saw our country established, saw the Revolutionary War, saw it, told how it would come about, saw the restoration of the gospel. He's just going along great. But he really wants to tell us about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. So he tells us about the unlearned man that gets the book. And then he gives it, it says, uh, and, and Nephi clarifies Isaiah. He doesn't give the book. And he, he gives writings from the book to a man, turned out to be Martin Harris who gave it to a learned man, and um, that turned out to be one of our greatest classical scholars in America uh, at um, Columbia College, which is now Columbia University. And then it tells how he couldn't read the book, and, and then the unlearned man did read it by the power of God, and then it came forth to all the world. And, and then uh, are the verses which were given to Joseph Smith in the first vision. That's all the 29th chapter of Isaiah. Anyway, this is an exciting epic. And here's Isaiah going along, or Nephi goes along, beginning with 2 Nephi chapter 25. He's just going along, great guns, and all of a sudden he says, he gets just up about, to, I think about 1994. Anyway, he's, he gets to the point where we're in Russia and we're in China, and we're in every country in the world. That's where he was cut off. So we're not quite... We're not quite to the close of Nephi's vision, but we're almost there, and we're going to be in, in China, and we're going to be in Russia. In any event, uh, all of a sudden he says, the Spirit stoppeth mine utterance. He was stopped a second time. He was so anxious to tell us. Now, I don't think he would have been anxious to tell us if it had been all disaster. I think what he was trying to tell us was, hang on, it's going to be rough. But if you do your part, you're going to come out all right. And I think he wanted to encourage us because I've seen how great it will be. It'll be as great as Isaiah said it would be if you'll hang on. Otherwise, just like the first half of the 21st chapter, 3rd Nephi, it's terrible. Anyway, I think that's what he was doing. Anyway, we finally got, it looks like kind of a big book because it is. <laughs> but what we did, put... Here's Isaiah on one column, and then the commentary. Everything we could find out about it, that the church knew or that we've been able to find about on the other. Sometimes the commentary is very brief, and other times it isn't so brief. We, the church knows a tremendous amount about that verse. And so, it, you know, it'll cover several pages. But it was an exciting book to write. And a great, there was a great spirit writing the book because it fed right into the other book that I was writing that grew out of the assignment that I'd previously had on writing God's great law of liberty. Isaiah and Nephi said that this country would become very corrupt and that it would then depend upon God's servants and those who were like-minded to try to turn it around. And if they turned it around in, fast, uh, in, in time, then the nation would be preserved. And the last half of 21st chapter 3rd Nephi describes this nation helping us build a new Jerusalem. This nation working together in the days when the kingdom of God would, be, would prevail upon the earth prior to the millennium. I want you to listen to uh, someone talking and see if you can guess who this is. The kingdom of God, speaking of this time just before the millennium, consists... Uh, it consists in correct principles, and it matters not what a man's religious faith is, 
whether it's Presbyterian or a Methodist, a Baptist, a Latter-day Saint or Mormon, a Campbellite or a Catholic, an Episcopalian or a Mohammedan, or even a pagan or anything else, if they will bow the knee and with the tongue confess that Jesus is the Christ and will support good and wholesome laws for the regulation of society, we hail him as a brother and will stand by him while he stands by us. And these things, for every man's religious faith, is a matter between his own soul and his God alone. Who do you think said that? That's Brigham Young. And he was speaking about this great day that's right ahead of us now, when all good people, they won't all join the church. A lot of people say, well, they have to join the church or we can't save the country. This is not true. The church has never taught that doctrine. But they do say that the Gentiles have to repent and they have to turn back toward the Savior, who is the God of this land. And then we will begin to turn it around and we'll get rid of all this gay movement, this perversion, this Sodom and Gomorrah garbage that is just spreading across this land, contaminating even some of the children of the righteous. We'll, we'll get rid of the narcotics and all this the addictive drugs and all of the perversion, the alcoholism that's going on. We'll be able to do that if we combine them. Now this year, coincidentally with all of this, I've had the, the privilege of addressing several thousand ministers of many faiths in conferences from Boston, New York, to San Francisco and back again. Uh, amazing the response of these people to this message about the Constitution and the need to rally and unite against evil. So you don't talk about theology, because theology divides us. Uh, you talk about something that won't divide us, uniting against evil. Now the church must move out among these people. We must do it more and more and uh, make ourselves uh, available to them so that they know what we have. And we're not an exclusive church. We're an inclusive church. And uh, the brethren have been pleading with us to make our influence felt among the people more than we have. And this got us into trouble. The brethren knew, beginning with J. Reuben Clark especially, that uh, this nation was crumbling and that the very foundation stones were eroding. And when I was in uh, George Washington University Law School, uh, just as the Depression was coming to its uh, full fruition, uh, Professor Compton said that Congress is wrong on that. They, they have no authority to do what they're doing. And I said, well, Dr. Compton, some of them are good friends of mine. They're real estate people and farmers, and they've been elected back here. They don't know anything about the Constitution. Where's a book we can give them? Well, he said, we have our case study, you know, it's three inches thick. I said, Dr. Compton, we can't even understand that. And we're going to have a hard time passing the bar based on that case study. Where's a book that tells them about the Constitution? Well, you know, he said, uh, it's complicated. And I'm not sure uh, I can refer you to one right away. And I think that's when the trigger was pulled in my uh, mind or said that someday we have to write a book that resurrects the original, pure, pure pristine vitality of the Founding Fathers' version. Now, in the 98th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord praises the Founding Fathers. And he says, they established a government here in this land in a form which if anyone establishes anything more or less than this, it will be evil. And in the 104th section, he said, now I want you to find good people and elect them into office that will sustain these principles. And of course, J. Reuben Clark came along and said, even our own people when elected are not sustaining these principles. Now, we've got to study them more. We've got to get more involved. President McKay, he would have a major sermon given every conference. You can go back and check it, asking the saints to get involved and become better informed, study the Constitution. I knew why they weren't studying the Constitution. We didn't have any place to study. The founders' precepts had not been in any textbook in their pure, vital form since about 1850. Just the story it was about the last one to put it in their terminology with their values and their precepts. That's why, you know, everybody said, I love the Constitution. Oh, uh, we swear to uphold it. Not even lawyers knew what it was about, really. 
Certainly politicians didn't know what it was about. So we were kind of wandering. Good people with good intentions. We were wandering. So anyway, we struggled along and went through about 125 volumes of the founder's original writings. I want to tell you that was thrilling. They had answers to nearly every problem we have today. I said, we just got to finally, we got to, get, we got to put that together so that the average person can pick it up and kind of go through it. Anyway, right while we were doing Isaiah, we were also doing this other. And it was about a 14-year project as it finally came together. Um, then I saw something happening in the church which was distressing because as some of the members of the church began studying these issues and saw how, how vicious the secret combination was, they wanted everybody to drop missionary work, genealogy, <laughs> and get involved in studying these things. I mean, you go through a shock treatment. So they bring it up in priesthood and in relief society, and the brethren noticed something. President McKay actually encouraged it to a degree because nobody knew how else to do it. I mean, where do you get together and talk about these things? It's only in church. But it had a catastrophic consequence because you could take any major issue and introduce it into priesthood meeting and split that priesthood quorum wide open. And they'd take strong, volatile positions of what was right and what was wrong. And the brethren began to notice that after the issue had been settled back in Washington, the, the, the the division remained. The division that grew out of the spirit of contention over issues remained. And men became permanent enemies, hostile, distrusting, suspicious. <coughs> and probably no one was doing better research on the secret combination at that time than the John Birch Society. The only problem was that some of those who became members of the John Birch Society wanted to make what they were studying in their weekly meetings, the Relief Society lesson and the priesthood lesson and so forth. Actually, what they were finding out, it was outside of the government. We'd had 14 investigative committees. They were proving the same thing and from independent sources. It was there. It was very real. We had the head of, uh, of the Communist Party with an office in the basement all during World War II. We had unions actually controlled from top to bottom by people who were out to destroy the United States. And I was in the FBI at the time, and it was a lot more serious than many Americans realized. So, what do we do? If this is splitting the church, what do we do? So the Brethren announced a brand new policy. We will discuss the principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ in church, and that's all. And we will not introduce these controversial subjects. That was misinterpreted by the members of the church. That meant don't get involved in these things at any time. And so we've raised a generation of virtually uninformed people on, on public su subjects, public issues, unless they had some special reason to study them. It was taboo. You didn't talk about it in a social group. You didn't talk about it in a class. You didn't attend the classes where it was being discussed. It's been taboo in the kingdom. Now the kingdom is changing back. Now we're moving back. Now the brethren say, aren't we mature enough to keep the church going in its great mission and yet become informed and involved in the affairs of this nation? We've got to save it. We have a responsibility to save it. Now, that's the background and the motivation and some of the perspective that went into the day and night efforts for about 14 years. I don't know what was waking me up at 4 o'clock every morning, but it was. You haven't read it. You're not doing it fast enough. You've got to go faster. You haven't got it yet. You don't understand that aspect of it. And sometimes I'd read a whole volume and only be two paragraphs and I got to condense down. So condensation was the objective. So this book came out a week ago Friday. And, it's, and it looks like a big book, because it is. It's 880 pages, but uh, good news. It's full of pictures, and it's big print, lots of space, you see, so it isn't really that bad. Uh, you, you shouldn't let it intimidate you. But that's 
That's the founder's story. That's, it has my name as author. That's not really true. The author is the founder. That's their original, beautiful, vital, pristine story for the building of a free people. It'll work for any nation. A developing nation can put that to work tomorrow. <clears throat> It'll make a prosperous, free people out of them. If they'll follow the formula, you've got to follow the formula. Founder said there are 28 basic things you've got to have in a culture if they are self-governing and free, if they may, and will maintain their freedom. You've got to have 28. We published that in a separate book called 5,000 Year Leap. Then after you've got that in a culture, which is capable of being self-governing, how will you structure a constitution? So we took the fabric of the constitution, pulled out each one of the golden threads, and examined it individually. There are 286 of them woven into the fabric of the Constitution by the founders and their successors. 286. And you get to hear what the founders said about that principle. So you'll see in the, in the, as you get over after the historical part, you get over into this part of the book, every principle's number. And you can look it up. And that's what they said about it. And, in, and there's a little history about it. Sometimes it's quite, quite lengthy, other times it's very brief. Just so you understand what that principle was. They had to identify, debate, and uh, accept 286 principles. In the process, they were addressing over 200 questions that they found answers for. Now, when I presented this to the Bicentennial Commission last Tuesday, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, um, I noticed our little program says it was in Philadelphia. It was actually in the Supreme Court building in that beautiful West Conference room. And the Chief Justice is the chairman. He's presiding. And uh, his, you, you could tell that uh, these, these basic ideas were moving him. I mentioned that the Founding Fathers had addressed over 200 specific questions and come up with answers for them. And we got a telephone call from Ted Kennedy, who's also on the commission, his office, called us and said, we want those 200 questions that the founders answered. Well, it's just great, you know, we can get those, begin to get those things out. And uh, <clears throat> then um, we <clears throat> had a call from CBS and they said, we want copies of the material that you give to children and the copies of the new book. So I was sent back to the <clears throat> Federal Express. <laughs> I, don't know I don't know what CBS is going to do with it, <clears throat> but anyway, it went back. The thing that's thrilling to me is we've done, we've done the sweating now. We, we finally captured it. We've got the founders' original, pristine, pure, vital views on how to build and maintain a free people. And, and, the, and I guess, number two, you can discuss it in church without having any controversy. We now can come in on neutral ground and discuss the gospel. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if now the brethren will be ready for a course on God's great law of liberty. The reason they didn't do it before is because they were fearful it couldn't be discussed without controversy. <clears throat> now that we've documented all of the principles, you don't have anything to do but learn that two times two is four. You don't have to discuss whether it's seven or five. That's what we've been doing. We've just wasted more time trying to de decide whether two times two is seven or would it be better to say it was five, you know. Maybe it's three, you know, you just can't tell. <clears throat> now we got past that and now we hit on four and that's all we talk about and that's what we memorize and that's what we we, we um, massage in our minds and fit it all together because it's beautiful you let one part of the Constitution erode and it definitely affects another branch and you get the whole thing out of balance and finally you 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 have a reason and a rationale why the founders would have rejected the 16th Amendment all through their writings, they warned against direct taxes. They said, if you ever use them, do it just temporarily in time of war. Direct taxes are terrible. You cannot assess them fairly, and you can't collect them without violating the Fourth Amendment. And we've made it the very foundation of our system of finance for the government. And it turned loose great forces of greed and selfishness and self-interest. The founders knew it would. And we found ourselves now trying to satisfy the political pressures and not only spending everything we would get through an oppressive and excessive confiscatory taxation system, but we started borrowing from our kids. 
we are now squandering the next generation's inheritance. We're up to nearly two trillion dollars of national debt. We're not going to pay that. That's our children. We're stacking that debt on them. Jefferson said that's immoral. He said, you can't uh, pass one generation's debt on to the next generation. That is taxation without representation. We're doing it. We're the first generation in America that ever did that. So as you go through this, you don't have a lot to discuss uh, in a controversial spirit. You just hear the founders say, let us caution you. If you do this, you will have distress and difficulty. And we've had enough historical experience to know they were right. So we're now in a, on a neutral ground. And to make it easy for people, we have about 89 pages of indices at the back on the Constitution and the text of the book. You can look up anything about the Constitution, any of the principles. Uh, and uh, it's kind of like the index in Isaiah. Look up America. And you read those passages and it'll thrill you as you say, hey, this is us. One third of Isaiah is our day. That's why we call it Isaiah Speaks to Modern Time. So it's kind of a story of two books coming out simultaneously. One describing what we could expect. The other one, hopefully, uh, providing the answer so we can get out of this mess. Now, somebody else may do this better. But that really is my best effort. I, I, I knew when I finally turned that over to to Andy and our wonderful crew of technicians that get every jot and tittle properly in there. Haven't found a single misspelled word yet, maybe one in there, but they are just great. They've just done such a wonderful job putting it in. I just felt like a mountain had been lifted off my shoulders. For 14 years, my brain had been a tornado. Wake up in the middle of the night, you didn't put in this. You, you know Adam said that. I missed that. Got to get that in there. Next morning. There are five things you didn't put in yesterday. You know? Gotta get that in. Anyway, <clears throat> actually, it's 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 about 26 volumes reduced into one, as far as my brain is concerned. That's what I feel like. I feel like we just condensed and condensed and condensed till you could get a grip on it. Let me close now by just reading two two um, things that are pertinent to the occasion. I think you've heard it said that the Constitution will hang by a thread. Prophet Joseph didn't say that. But the brethren remembered what he said, and they kind of coined the phrase, hang by a thread. He didn't use that phrase, but once it was used by one of the brethren, the others grabbed hold of it. And they all remembered him saying the prophecy, but nobody could find the prophecy. So he didn't know exactly what he said. Some said, the nation will fall, but the saints will keep it alive wherever they are. And Brigham Young said, no, that isn't what he said. He said it would fall if the saints didn't do their part. That's what he said. So there's a little controversy there. Finally, Hiram Andrus, bless his heart, going through reams and reams of material accumulated in the church historian's office that nobody had ever reviewed, came across the speech. It had been recorded partly in shorthand, had done, been done in pencil, and this particular one was in shorthand. That is, it was written out. It wasn't in shorthand, it was written out. Here's what Joseph Smith said. Even this nation will be on the very verge of crumbling to pieces and tumbling to the ground. And when the Constitution is upon the brink of ruin, this people will be the staff upon which the nation shall lean. And they shall bear the Constitution away from the very verge of destruction. Which verifies Brother Lee's prophecy, this nation will not fall. We're going to have some troubles, he said, but it will not fall. I can promise you that in the name of the Lord. It will not fall. Look what the Lord says. The brethren don't run out and say, Wait for us, we're your leaders. Notice what it says. And the nation, and this people will be the staff upon which the nation shall lean. That means Latter-day Saints have got to know their constitution. And they've got to start teaching it. And they've got to be identified among the people so that when the people are in distress, they will say there are those who know the answers. And they will lean upon them as a staff and say, will you please come and help us? It'll be in that kind of a spirit. Our task is to be prepared so we have answers. Uh, do you know what the founder's answer was? Yes. Will you give it to us? Yes. That's the way it's going to be. And uh, uh, finally, last of all, we came across 
a fact that several of the brethren had had revelations of our day, and it was pretty distressing. President Taylor, we thought it was Brother Woodruff because Brother Woodruff had it in his journal, but apparently it was a vision by Brother Taylor when he was president of the church. And um, he saw a period of just terrible events happening, particularly in the East. Invasion, destruction, uh, uh, no, 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 no one even left alive in some of the Eastern cities. Totally desolated. And then another brother had the same vision, only he had the rest of it. And brother Taylor's revelation is only the bad part. And this man saw it all. He was the patriarch in Utah County. And uh, <clears throat> the, the church brethren published it in um, what was before the era was called a contributor. And it uh, was published three times. The last time, the one that I have here is 1894. That's the third time it was published. It actually, he had received it sometime earlier. And um, uh, this great man, um, his first name here, Charles D. Evans of Springville, Utah. And the first presidency said, uh, let's get that, let's get that recorded. Now, as he was taken through the vision, he had a companion just like Nephi did. And he was taken through the vision. He saw this terrible, threatening destruction. He said, a foreign power had invaded the nation, which from every human indication it appeared would seize the government and supplant it with monarchy. I stood trembling at the aspect when, lo, a power arose in the West, which declared itself in favor of the Constitution in its original form. To this suddenly rising power, every lover of constitutional rights and liberties throughout the nation gave hearty support. Now you're getting close to it. The struggle was fiercely contested, but the stars and stripes floated in the breeze and bidding defiance to all opposition, and inscribed upon it was the government based on the Constitution now and forever. On another banner, liberty of conscience, social, religious, and political. And then he saw the building of the New Jerusalem right after that. Then he saw Zion cities all up and down North America. And he went into the universities. And he said they were studying Europe through Urim and Thummim. He said it was amazing. I was allowed to go into the university and see what the students were studying. And they would look back in history. You didn't study theory on geology. He said it was amazing. We knew how the earth was created. And we knew how Adam and Eve were put here. Everybody studied out of the Urim and Thummim. And you got to see what actually occurred. You didn't have to speculate. He said it was marvelous indeed. Marvelous. And as you contemplate it, it truly is. Now, you see, this is within the lifespan of this upcoming generation. Now, these are the things they need to be trained. As I say to the young people who are attending a lot of our seminars, your generation has to do this. You've got the job. We did the studying. We put it together. You've got it now. Now, you go out among the people and let them know you've got the answers. That's your job. So that when they're in distress, you can combine together and raise up the banner, the Constitution and the tradition of the Founding Fathers, and they'll rally. They're already beginning to rally. And I was very thrilled when we presented our, our all of our material that we're doing and writing to the Bicenten Constitutional Bicentennial Commission. You could just feel a great spirit of confirmation in that room. And there were men sitting up there who were enemies politically on that commission. All of a sudden, a nice spirit settled on us and I think it can now begin happening in the church we can move in now on neutral ground we won't discuss individual issues just study the principles two times two equals four we used to study is it five or is it seven oh I think it's three and that's what divided we don't have to do that anymore now we can go in study what really is the truth that was our our hope and to keep people up with the current constitutional problems, we have our magazine called the Constitution Magazine. Now that's going out more and more to universities and others. And if you aren't a subscriber, I recommend it to you. Uh, I'm not trying to sell books. I'm not trying to sell magazine subscriptions. We're just trying to do the sweat and the labor for which we receive no compensation except the satisfaction of seeing it go forth in order that we can get this thing back in the middle stream again. It's got to be a centerpiece again in our lives. 
And then the Lord will bless us. And he'll raise up friends to us. And we'll become the influence for good that we'd like to become among our brethren. And when we establish the kingdom of God, they won't all be Mormons. They'll be Methodists and Presbyterians and wonderful people who understand that Jesus is the Christ. They're not ready to become Mormons or too many meetings. <clears throat> but they'll do, they'll do everything else. They want to particularly go on missions. But they will support good laws. And as Brigham Young says, I've seen the vision of it. And I want you Mormons to get accustomed to thinking in terms of all the human race and not just yourselves. Your role is leadership. And everybody who supports these principles will be welcome. So in our magazine, we study these issues as they come out. And one of them, on the Garcia case by John Armour, the Tenth Amendment was virtually wiped out this spring by a decision of the Supreme Court. And if you're a lawyer, you know that that's very serious and very significant. You'll never forget the Garcia case until it's repealed. It's an abomination and gives the federal government the power to go out down into the most minute aspect of your um, personal life as far as economics and finances are concerned with no prohibition whatsoever anymore, quoting the Garcia case. The Butler case uh, turned over the welfare clause upside down, the very opposite of what it meant. And in just one generation, we went from a budget, federal budget of $6 billion to $600 billion. We have corrupted the whole system in this generation. Now we've got to turn it around. You've been very patient listeners. I told you, I, I've taken more time than I anticipate, but it's a big subject. And I'm trying to summarize 14 years or more. Really, it extends back over 40 years of research and writing and struggle and mental anguish, trying to find how we could someday sit down as brothers and sisters and study God's great law of liberty and not have it split us apart. I think now we can do that. That's our hope. Thanks, all of you, for coming. We very much appreciate your being here. And um, in this audience, uh, I'd I just like to close with a little special uh, expression of appreciation to, to Heavenly Father. You know, you, you, t you undertake some of these tasks. They're too big for you. And... Uh, uh, you, you sort of learn to cry before the Lord sometimes in anguish, frustration, um, because you can't do it. You're not equal to it. You can't handle it. And then it opens up for you. And then you have to get back on your knees and say, Heavenly Father, <clears throat> thank you for helping me. I, I, I couldn't see the way out of it. Thank you. I've got it now. Got it. And you put it down. And other people say, my, that's great. I don't must have a brilliant mind. No, I know where it came from. You get help. You get wonderful help. That's where it comes from. I just want to share that with you because uh, the big breakthroughs in these two books came with an awful lot of help. God is in his heaven. He loves us. I pray the Lord's blessings upon you. We, we, we belong to the, the great restored gospel kingdom. Prophets are back in the earth. It's true. I testify it's true because I know it's true. You know it's true. And I pray for his blessings on us and do it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask? A few years ago, Dr. Skousen was into uh, Canada as well as South Africa trying to establish constitutional forms of government there. I just, do you have an update on those or what's, what's happening? <coughs> Yeah, very briefly, while Mr. Trudeau was the head of the Canadian government, he practically demolished all of the rights of the Canadian people. And Calgary, for example, uh, that had all the major oil companies moving in, uh, is now almost a ghost city. You've got huge skyscrapers, all, no offices occupied as a result of Trudeau's policy on oil. In any event, um, they asked us, they set up a, an ad hoc committee and uh, having been born in Canada, I was made chairman of a committee to uh, uh, write a new constitution for Canada. Trudeau had written a constitution, so we wrote a, <laughs> a people's constitution. Anyway, it's now beginning to get quite a bit of attention. It was published. Of course, Trudeau uh, didn't have anything to do with that, but he's out now. 
And we have a prime minister in now that's taking it very seriously. And uh, the man who really helped me the most, we had a committee of about 25, but only two of us really did the work. It gets like that sometimes in committees. And uh, Dr. T Robert Thompson helped me prepare it. And he was, he'd been a member of Parliament in Canada for 12 years, and so that put us right on the inside. And as I go back and read it now, we had a lot of help on that one too. It doesn't look like the American Constitution at all. They warned me, don't let it look like the U.S. Constitution or it'll, die, it'll never fly. So it looks a little different, but all the principles are there. They're the same. And uh, so that's how that one got written. Now, our friends from South Africa, uh, beginning about seven years ago, uh, paid our way for my wife and myself to come down and interview the top leaders of the various uh, companies. Uh, parties, <clears throat> and uh, they had us appear on, uh, they have a national television and radio, and we were on radio and television uh, about 15 times there in about two weeks. And so it gave us a chance to cultivate a lot of friends, and, and I could see what was wrong. They said, now, if you wrote a constitution for us, um, how would it be different from what we're doing? And I said, well, <clears throat> you have a constitution of vertical separation. You've got to make it horizontal. I said, what does that mean? I said, you've divided your people according to race. And that'll never fly. You've got to put your roadblocks up this way so that only your finest people rise to the top. But anybody, if they'll cross the hurdles, can get there. And if Abraham Lincoln is born in a log cabin, he can get up there. He'll pay the price. And yours has got to be set up so that it won't matter what race you belong to, you can get to the top and pay the price. I said, I, and I, we're staying in one of the nicest hotels in Johannesburg. I'm surrounded by a whole lot of blacks. No apartheid there. They said, no, if they, pro if they cross the cultural gap, we accept them as peers. But these are hard people to civilize, believe us, costing us a lot of money. I said, I know it's hard, but set up, we, we, we had some native problems also. <clears throat> but uh, anyway, set up your constitution horizontally. And they said, w will you help us? And I said, you bet, we'll be glad to. Well, um, we set up our institute down there, but it did not thrive. It just had a very small group of people, and um, it's still there. It hasn't gone anywhere, and they haven't asked for any more. We're a little reluctant to go in unless we're asked. Now, just as a closing note, um, we have been asked to go into Brazil. It looks like I was just down in Brazil, and they said, would you write a constitution for us? And I said, no. We've learned a better way. They said, then what would you do? I said, we would bring down 200 questions that you have to address, your commission has to address. And uh, we will tell you what answers have been used by different countries and which ones worked and which ones didn't. That's like a smorgasbord, and you just pick and choose and write your own constitution. And the newspaper there in St. Paul said, you mean you're not going to force the American constitution down us, down our throats? I said, no, we're so far off base on our American constitution, our founding fathers wouldn't even, even recognize it. I wouldn't even recommend it to you, as we're now practicing it. I said, we've got a lot of restructuring to do there. What I would do is recommend to you uh, the American Founding Fathers' original formula for any country that the United States has got to get back to. Oh, that's all right. That is amazing. Good spirit came right over. The Congress is very much influenced by this left-wing group that was the, the destroyed Rhodesia. The best hope Rhodesia had for the blacks was that little segment of European civilization. didn't matter what color their skin was, that was a chance for the blacks to get an education and get jobs. It's all gone. And last year they killed 7,000 people. You didn't read word one in the press about it. Just butchered them. The government did it. You don't hear about that. And you have two or three killed in these uh, prov provoked riots uh, there in near Johannesburg and it's in all the papers. So anyway, they're doing, we're playing the same old worn out record we did in Rhodesia and we'll get the same horrible results. I talked to a whole group of blacks down there from PhDs down to people who could speak English but were working in the gold mines, ordinary blacks. 
And I asked them the big question, which seven years ago was up everywhere, should there be one man, one vote in South Africa? The blacks will say no. The Zulus will take over. They're the most vicious of all the tribes. They're the biggest. And No, we don't want Zulus. Well, then what do you want? We want jobs and education. Well, what about your politics? That comes later. Don't worry about that. Jobs and education. That's the way blacks talk. And the blacks that we hear to do and some of these people you see, these are Marxist, uh, Buddha is right. He said there's, there's a foreign influence has moved in there and trying to speak on behalf of the blacks, and it's a lie, just as it was in Rhodesia. They're not speaking for the blacks. So Jerry Falwell went down there, and he talked to the blacks and found out that Tutu was a phony. It was unfortunate <laughs> he used that word because he had to apologize for it, but Tutu is a phony. He's not even a South African in sentiment, represents some of the churches down there, but some of the churches are so far off base, they don't even, they don't rec they don't even represent religion anymore. They're for a Marxist world. Anyway, when Jerry Falwell came back and appeared on national television, he asked me to stand right beside him. He said, now, <laughs> they ask, may ask me a constitutional question, and you, you stand right here. I said, okay, but they didn't. He handles himself so well, there was no problem. But anyway, he's back from Africa now, and he, he really told the story as we saw it. It was a very accurate report on his part. So you're right. See, the, the Mono Doctrine said we wouldn't meddle in the affairs of other nations. We're now meddling in the affairs of almost every nation and trying to buy their friendship with money we don't have. So we got to change this around. We've just had the wrong people in high places. Did you have another thought? Yeah, one thing. I appreciate you, Mark. There. You mentioned two or three times the date 1994 on Isaiah. How do you establish that? I didn't. Uh, it's, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. I was just, I said about 1994. <laughs> it's someplace up there where we're in Russia and we're in China. That's about as far as Nephi got to see. When we get in, 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 in Russia and China, you'll know that's about when Nephi's vision closed. And from then on, we're going to be very close. You see the opening of the seventh seal, and if you know anything about that, it's going to be real challenging. We're going to need to be uh, pretty close-knit, watching our P's and Q's, staying close to the Lord, practicing the principles because it, it's going to be a critical period. But I appreciate your asking me that because I didn't want to leave the impression that I'm not one to give dates for prophecies. I, uh, but you can see the trend. And I wanted to, as, as far as I can see it, you know, spring, summer is coming. <laughs> the, the leaves are beginning to bud out. And it, it, we're pretty close to getting into Russia. China, you can't believe Deng, a man who helped uh, slaughter 40 million Chinese with Mao Zedong and, and Shou and Lai, all of a sudden says these communes are archaic. They're not working. Uh, you, uh, we own the land, but we'll let you peasants farm as much as you can farm efficiently. Get rich. You're on your own. Well, he wouldn't dare call that uh, free enterprise. Do you know what he called it? enriched Marxism. <laughs> so all of a sudden, we're going to be in China. Uh, I would ask, speculate within two years. I mean, those people have got television sets now. Things are changing in China. Now, the, the, Russia has already taken a look at free enterprise. They've turned it down temporarily. But they're in such a mess there. Um, they've got some hawks that want to take Europe, and they could do it. Europe has not been righteous. They've turned on our missionaries and almost excluded us. They may reap a whirlwind. And they've got it all set up and they've already gone through the, the great tank attacks. They won't use nuclear weapons at all. And they'll say to the United States, don't you try to hold us back with nuclear weapons or then we'll use them. And that would paralyze us because we, we do not have the conventional weapons in NATO to hold back 28,000 Soviet tanks. So they, what they do is go up north and south as far as it takes to get from Poland into Paris. That's where the launching pad will be. Only they practice north and south instead of east and west. And they worked out the number of casualties they'll probably suffer. They figure they can be in Paris in five days. 
and it takes Congress that long, you know, just to uh, get the minutes read. <laughs> and, and that's what they're depending upon. They said they will not react fast enough. They're yeah. planning to bowl NATO, and they might do it. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union is contemplating uh, opening up their culture just a little. We've got a temple in East Germany. We've got a stake in East Germany. You want to talk about miracles? That's one. Believe me, that's one. <laughs>